Well, howdy. As I'm getting ready for my next big World War II reenactment, which is D-Day Ohio 2023, it's only a couple days away as I'm recording this, I wanted to loop you guys in on the process of how I prep my uniforms and equipment for a reenactment. So today I'll be telling you guys a little bit about the division that I'm portraying and the event that I'm going to. I'll tell you about how I determine what I should or should not wear to accurately portray a soldier from that division. And then I'll go through all the gear that I'm planning on wearing for this impression. And I'll even try all of it on for you at the end so you can really get the full effect. On a side note, I'd like to quickly mention that I feel very official standing in front of this World War II 48 star flag while I'm talking. I feel like I'm the president or something. So my fellow Americans, Let's talk about the division that I'll be representing, which is the 1st Infantry Division, also known as the Big Red One. I'm not going to get into the whole history of the 1st Infantry Division or the 1st Division as it was originally called in World War I, but all you really need to know for the purposes of this video is that the 1st Infantry Division is well known for their actions on D-Day. The 1st ID, along with the 29th and a bunch of other groups, were tasked with taking Omaha Beach, and the 1st Infantry Division is widely known for taking ground on Omaha Beach, landing in those early waves, and taking high casualty rates. So why am I portraying the 1st Infantry Division at this event. Well, the event has a pretty strict list of units that were allowed to portray there just because they want to keep it accurate to units that would have actually landed in the initial waves at D-Day, which is what we're portraying. And as you may recall, I attended in previous years with my 6th Naval Beach Battalion group, but we ran into some logistical issues, so I'm jumping in with another group of guys who's representing the 1st ID. I keep saying 1st Infantry Division, but more specifically, we're representing the 16th RCT, or Regiment combat team. That was the infantry regiment of the 1st ID that landed in those early waves at Omaha Beach. So that's who we're representing on a regimental level. So now that we've discussed that, I think we're about ready to talk about how I actually decided what uniforms and pieces of equipment I'd be wearing. But real quick, I want to talk about this event specifically and kind of the purpose of this impression and what I'm going for. You may have heard me talk in the past about the different types of World War II reenactments that I take part in. There are military history events where we're really just setting up a camp with displays that we can explain to visitors who want to check them out. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum is tacticals where we kind of go off into the woods, nobody's watching, and we're using pretty much only period equipment to live like a World War II soldier would have for a couple days in a row. Now those experiences are really good for teaching me more about what it was like for World War II soldiers, which is great because then I can share that with all of you. But this specific event that I'm getting ready for is a public battle reenactment. That means there's going to be a big crowd watching all of us kind of simulate a battle. That way people in the crowd can get a better understanding of what uniforms and equipment guys used back then, the different weapons and how those were implemented and how they work, and also things like planes and tanks and other vehicles that you don't often get to see in person. So this event is kind of one extra piece in understanding what happened on D-Day that you can't really get in the same way from watching a movie or reading a book. Even though, of course, I do recommend doing those things. With that being said, the goal of my impression regarding what I'm wearing and what it looks like is that when people in the crowd look at me down on the beach, it's accurate to what a soldier in the 1st Infantry Division might have looked like on Omaha Beach. For those other types of battles that I described, often called tacticals, the goal is more for us to understand what it's like to live like a World War II soldier. So for those, not only do I want to look like a World War II soldier, I want to have all the appropriate equipment inside my pack and in my pockets. I want to have rations that are somewhat similar to what a World War II soldier would have eaten. And of course, I'm going to have to carry all the stuff I need, like toiletry items and blankets to sleep with at night, because we're living in the field like World War II soldiers. For this battle, I'm more concerned about what I look like from the outside to the crowd who's watching. And even though I'm sure I'll have some period items tucked in my pocket, it, I'm not really too concerned with having the right kind of rations inside my pack that nobody's ever going to see. So maybe in the future when I'm preparing for one of those tacticals, I'll do a detailed breakdown of everything that I'm carrying and how that compares to what a World War II soldier would have carried. But for this one, the focus will be on gear and uniforms, not necessarily what kind of spoon I have tucked in my pocket. 
So speaking of gear and uniforms, how did I determine what kind of uniform I'm going to wear, what sort of gear would be appropriate, and everything else? Well, thankfully for reenactors, there are a lot of resources to help with those decisions, and that's good because we really do put a lot of thought into those decisions, and we want to look the part. So in my case, some of the resources I used were the authenticity guidelines provided by the event. Now these are usually the most general guidelines because people are portraying different groups, and you want to leave it up to the individual in the group to kind of research what they're going to do and exactly what to wear. But as far as general basic items that you're going to need, those guidelines can be good to kind of point you in the right direction and get you started. Then I'm part of a reenacting group that I'm attending with, so they have their own regulations and recommendations for what kind of gear you should use for this event. These ones are a little more specific. Usually in my group's case, they'll recommend exactly what type of items you need and even list some places where you can buy those things. And they'll also give a simple breakdown of who would have worn what and what pieces of equipment are appropriate for different impressions. And finally, this is by far the most important resource and the one that's the most fun to look into. And that's original pictures and of course, written accounts from veterans who were actually there on D-Day. Famous photographer Robert Kappa actually landed with the 16th Infantry Regiment of the 1st Infantry Division on D-Day. So we don't exactly have to guess what soldiers in the 1st Infantry Division would have had on when they landed at Omaha Beach. Some of Kappa's photos are very blurry and it can be hard to see details. But we do have some really good photos from him and other photographers showing what the 1st Infantry Division soldiers were wearing when they landed on Omaha Beach. I'll try to point out some of the details in these photos later that influence my decisions when I'm actually showing you the gear that I'm bringing. But for now, just realize that looking at original photos is the bread and butter of creating a World War II impression. So without any further ado, let's take a look at the gear and uniforms that I'll be using for my 1st Infantry Division Rifleman impression. All right, so I tried to nicely lay out my gear here so you can get an idea of everything that I'm bringing along for this impression. Keep in mind that not every single item shown here is something I'll actually be wearing during the beach battle reenactment. For example, I also have my PT uniform over here, which you would not wear while hitting the beach, but those items will be useful around camp and I'll make sure to try those on for you as well. Okay, so I was planning on going through all the items that I laid out over here and talking about them a bit and then trying everything on at the end. But I think it makes more sense for me to explain what everything is as I try it on. That way you can see how each item is used and how it's worn, and then you'll still get to see the full impression once I put everything on. I mentioned that I have my PT uniform set out back there, so why don't we start by knocking that out first? All right, let's get started. Alrighty, here's the PT uniform. So essentially, this is just a vintage looking white t-shirt. I made a whole video last year about how I looked far and wide for shirts like this that looked like the 1940s military t-shirts, and I ended up finding them in a pretty unlikely place. Yeah, these are uh, women's maternity shirts. Next, I have these reproduction US Army PT shorts. Now keep in mind that sometimes soldiers would just do PT in their full gear, but oftentimes you see in pictures from the time that soldiers would wear these PT shirts and shorts, and sometimes even PT shoes, which were made by companies like Converse. But it was most common for soldiers to do PT in whatever type of boots they were issued. So in my case, I'm wearing rough out boots, also called type threes. These are the service shoes that were implemented a little later in World War II, and these would have been very common around D-Day. Just a note, during World War II, soldiers would dub their boots with compounds like these that I have in these original tins from World War II. Those dubbing compounds were like waxy, greasy sealants that kind of sealed up the boots. And different types had different purposes. The two that I showed were the one for mold prevention that keeps your leather from molding. And the other one, which was the most common, is the gas prevention one, which would seal up the boots so that if there was a chemical gas attack, hopefully the gas wouldn't get to your feet and cause blisters and irritation. I did not end up dubbing these boots with original World War II boot dubbing. I have done that to a pair in the past, but those weren't rough out leather like this. This really soaks up the dubbing compounds. So I ended up having to frantically call my friend Edgar, who's a cobbler specializing in World War II reenacting shoes. You can check him out on Instagram. His handle's on screen and he does great work, but I had no idea how to go about dubbing my shoes. And of course he knows everything about that. So I had to call him up and try to figure out 
how to get that taken care of before the event that's in just a couple days. And I think they turned out pretty nicely. So that's it for the PT uniform. Let's get into the fun part, which is the uniform that I'll be wearing for the beach battle reenactment. Alrighty, so to start off here, I have an original World War II A-frame undershirt, and then some original M1937 wool trousers, and then of course I have those same Type 3 rough out service shoes that I just showed you a minute ago, but now I'm wearing my M1937 leggings or spats or gaiters, whatever you want to call them. I have those on top of the boots. I've heard people in the past ask what the purpose of leggings are, and they're basically just to keep things out of your shoe. Weather is expensive and canvas was a lot less expensive so it made a lot more sense to issue low boots and high leggings made of cheap canvas than to issue a bunch of knee-high leather boots to every soldier just so they didn't have to worry about getting things in their shoes. Then of course I just have my regular trouser belt here and I'm wearing my pants right up on my hips like they would have done back in the day and I have my dog tags on as well with a little p38 can opener that I can use to conveniently open my rations when I get hungry. Next, I'll add to that this wool shirt. Now, in reality for D-Day, the wool shirt and pants that I have on would have been impregnated with this chemical compound called CC2. Similar to what I said about the boot dubbing compound that was used, CC2 was like a waxy substance that sealed up the pores in the uniform and that acted as an extra barrier in case the enemy used chemical weapons, it couldn't reach your skin as easily. All right, now that that's on, let's talk about my jacket. Jacket. This is the US M41 jacket. When you look at original photos from D-Day, this is by far the most common jacket that you see soldiers wearing. This one is a reproduction made by At The Front and it's a little big on me, but you know what they say, there are only two sizes in the army, too big and too small. These jackets were also often impregnated with that compound called CC2. Any other infantry divisions on D-Day were issued the HBT uniforms, HBT standing for herringbone twill. That's just the weave and type of the fabric used to make those uniforms, but those uniforms weren't quite as common within the 1st Infantry Division, so I won't be wearing any HBT uniform items for this impression. Next up is the gas brassard. These were just pieces of paper that were treated with a chemical compound that would change colors if it was exposed to poisonous gas. These were typically worn on the shoulder and they were intended to alert soldiers that there was poisonous gas in the air because a lot of poisonous gases are completely colorless and odorless. Next up, I have my M1 helmet. I'm gonna come a little closer so you guys can see this. What I have here is an original World War II M1 helmet that I've re-sewn some new straps onto because because they were missing. And I've combined that with a post-World War II helmet liner. And this liner also has this little strip of Velcro that I used to attach my camera. That's how I filmed the battles. As you can see, I have a net on this helmet, which was very common for soldiers of the 1st Infantry Division. I also have little strips of burlap called scrim. You see a ton of guys with this burlap scrim in their helmets. It seems like not everyone in the 1st Infantry Division used it, but it was very common. And I also added this little eye shield onto my helmet. This is another item like the gas brassard that was issued in a soldier's gas mask bag. And it was just meant to shield your eyes in case there was a gas attack. Of course, many soldiers put these to other uses and in original photos, you can often see soldiers wearing these on their helmet. So if there is a gas attack or more likely if some dust or sand gets kicked up and you're trying to move through it, you can just pull this down over your eyes for some added protection. Now that we have the basic uniform Together, let's get into some of the web gear and equipment. The first thing I'll put on here is an M7 waterproof gas mask bag. This was a waterproof rubberized bag that held soldiers' gas masks, along with the other items that I mentioned, like the gas brassard, the eye shield, and a couple other chemical weapon defense items. For First Infantry Division soldiers, I found that it's most common to see them wearing this gas mask bag on their chest, but this bag could also be worn a number of other ways. You see soldiers strapping these to their side, strapping them to their leg, which is usually how you see airborne guys wearing them so it didn't interfere with their parachute harness and you even see guys wearing them as backpacks. After that I'll throw on my web gear. So what I have here is an M1928 haversack with a meat can pouch. As you can see there really is not a lot of room in this thing and this is where a soldier would have had to store pretty much all of their equipment. This pouch on top often called the meat can pouch was meant to hold your meat can or mess tin but for many soldiers who took part in the early waves of the invasion 
They were ordered to take their meat cans out of their meat can pouch and leave them behind on the ships so that they could use that pouch to carry extra items like more food, ammunition, grenades, things that would really make a difference in the first hours of D-Day. This pack is an original and I have a reproduction M1 Garand bayonet on the side. This is the 10 inch style bayonet. The earlier bayonets used a 16 inch blade, but by the time D-Day came along, you don't see as many of those long bayonets being used. I also have a T-handled shovel on here. This is an original that's been repainted with a reproduction cover on it. And then I have my cartridge belt, which could hold 10 N block clips for the M1 Garand rifle or 20 stripper clips for the M1903 Springfield. This also has my canteen hooked up to it as well as my first aid pouch right here. That little bandage pouch was used to hold a small tin containing a Carlisle bandage and some antibiotic powder to disinfect wounds. And every soldier was issued one of those. So if you came across somebody who was hurt or you got hit yourself, you would always have a bandage right there available to use. Next up, I will don the infamous M1926 life belt. These would be inflated using two CO2 cartridges housed in the end right here, or you could also manually inflate them by blowing into these two tubes. This was a life preserver, and as I've explained in my other video, many soldiers were dropped into deep water, so life preservers were very important. The problem was that this life preserver was meant to be worn up under your armpits, but many soldiers either just didn't know about that or couldn't put the life belt on with their pack and gas mask bag and everything else in the way. So you see in original photos, many guys are wearing this around their waist, or sometimes they're even worn low around the hips below a soldier's cartridge belt. Now you can imagine that if I was wearing the life belt low like this, and I jumped into deep water that was over my head, when this inflates, the belt will want to float and everything above it will want to sink, so it would literally flip you upside down if you wore it improperly. I've heard many reports of this happening. Of course, it's very difficult to get an accurate number of how many soldiers met that fate, but considering how common it is to see soldiers wearing these improperly in original photos, I would guess that a large number of soldiers unfortunately had some difficulties with their life belts. So now I have my life belt on and all my other equipment, but I don't have a ton of ammo, just those 10 clips that are inside of this cartridge belt. So why don't we add on two bandoliers? Each one has six end block clips for the US M1 Garand rifle. Now that we have some ammo, let's get our rifle. So here I have my US M1 Garand rifle in World War II configuration. This is what the majority of assault troops would have used on D-Day, but of course there were many other weapons like the M1 Thompson, M1 Carbine, BAR, and many other options for US infantry. Man, I am hot in this stuff just standing in my air conditioned room. I can't wait to run up a hot beach with the sun pounding on me in the middle of August, but it's hard to complain about that when we're doing this specifically to commemorate guys who had to run up a real beach under heavy enemy fire while taking very high casualties. Now, obviously what we're doing isn't going to be anything close to what those guys actually experienced, but the experiences of those men will be playing through my head the entire time I'm running up that beach. With all that being said, I think we're finally ready to board our landing craft and take that final journey in towards Omaha Beach. I'll be putting out plenty of footage from the event, both from my helmet cam and things that I'm going to film around camp. I might even try to make some more impression videos like this on my airborne impression and the 6th Naval Beach Battalion impression that I had planned to do this year before our plans changed. So keep in mind, this is not what every American soldier landing on D-Day would have been wearing, but I think this is a very accurate representation of what a rifleman in the 1st Infantry Division would have looked like on June 6, 1944. Please leave your thoughts in the comments and make sure you like and subscribe. It really helps out my channel. And other than that, thank you guys, and I'll see you on the beaches.